Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 167th live episode at DocSpot right here. Um, it's been a wonderful series of so much learning uh, these past few months. But today I am here. My name is Mitali Salvi. I'm a dog trainer and a behaviorist. Uh, I've been training dogs for the past nine years. I've had dogs ever since I remember life. Um, but I also have my board and train facility coming up in Mumbai. Today on this live, we have a very, very special guest. Um, here we have Ken Ramirez. Uh, Ken is actually the executive vice president and the chief training officer at Karen Pryor Clicker Training, uh, which anyone that is ha knows the training field and the training world uh, knows what a big deal that is, which is why I'm very excited to have a chat with you, Ken, right here. Ken has also worked um, with not just dogs, but multiple different species. And I'm actually really excited to know more about those experiences and learn so much more on this live chat with you today. Um, also, you started your career, if I'm not wrong, with guide dog work, um, which is actually quite interesting and exciting too. Um, so over to you, Ken. Uh, I think the, one of the first things that I would love to discuss with you and get your point of view on is, um, why training and behavior? Like, why do you train an animal and why do you understand behavior and work on behavior with an animal? Well, that's a great question, Mitali. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons why training is important. I think, uh, first of all, and most important, it's very natural. If you look at animals in the wild, Animals learn every day of their lives. They're learning how to survive. They're learning where to eat. They're learning many, many, many things. Training just allows us a mechanism for helping to facilitate that learning, to help them learn things that are going to help them live lives among us. If we're going to have pets, we want a pet that is well behaved. We want a pet that is accepted by society. And so training helps us do that. But more important than that, I believe training is a critical part of good professional animal care. Um, training allows us to give the animals mental stimulation. It gives us a, a, a mechanism to provide physical exercise. It's a way to teach animals to participate in their own care so that they live longer and healthier lives. So I think that training, good training, is a very humane thing to do, a very helpful thing to do. And one of the things it does for me and most people who train is it helps us communicate better with our animals. It helps us give us an insight into the way the animal thinks so that they can learn to live in our homes or in our lives peacefully, comfortably, and in a healthy way. Absolutely. Um, that's actually a great way that you put it. You know, That's something I actually tell my clients all the time is, um, when I look at training, I'm like, Hey, I'm giving the dog what it wants, but also, you know, getting what I want in the process. But I think it gets lost sometimes, uh, wherein sometimes I find people just want thinking about, you know, training in terms of just making us comfortable rather than thinking about, um, uh, what the animal's getting out of it as well. Yeah. Um, and, and if you can, yeah, if you can set your training up so that the animal feels safe, feels comfortable, feels like they're getting something from it, then you're more likely to get what you want from it as well because it becomes a cooperative process. Absolutely. That that makes complete, uh, complete sense. So how long have you been working with dogs specifically and how's that journey been? Well, it's interesting for me because I started when I was very young. I was still in... Um, high school when I got an opportunity to volunteer at a guide dog organization. And as a very young learner myself, I didn't work with the dogs directly, but I helped prepare dog food and clean kettles and, and got to watch the professional trainers working with dogs that were destined to help people who were visually impaired. But I ended up throughout my entire high school career working there. 
And by the final year that I was there, I became what they called a youth handler. And that means that I got to handle dogs that were being trained for young people. And I got to watch them learn. I got to help train. I didn't make any training decisions then, but I was handling a dog while a professional trainer was telling me when to pet the dog, how to hold the leash, how to reinforce the dog. And I became fascinated by that. And I think as a young student, I found myself thinking, wow, what a noble profession. I can play with dogs all day long, but help train them for an important job, for something that are going to help people who need these dogs. And so that was my first inkling that training would be important in my life. And I began looking at the study of behavior, animal behavior. Um, and uh, that was what got me started on this path toward becoming a trainer. It isn't the path that I got to where I am today directly because what ended up happening is as I went to the university, I ended up studying biology, I ended up studying animal behavior. And like many young people, um, I had to find a way to work my way through school so that I could afford going to school. And that took me in a couple of different directions, but I had an opportunity while I was still in the university to get a job working at a marine life park, a uh, a place that had dolphins and whales and sea lions and other types of animals. And I took a job doing that, uh, not working with the animals directly, but working in the education department. But it turned out that so much of what I had been studying about how to communicate with animals and how training works applied to working with those animals as well. Then I had an opportunity to get an entry level job working in that zoological organization. And I became fascinated with the fact that all animals learn the same way. Whether you're talking about a dog or a horse or a tiger or a dolphin, I was really beginning to see the connections between how all animals learn. And so I became very fascinated in learning as much as I could about that. And I began seeing that you could build a relationship with an animal and get a connection with an animal and learn new things about that animal. And it just fascinated me. And so that started me on this career path to learning about training multiple species and figuring out ways of teaching other people to do it as well. Because as I learned to train, I found that not everybody had the patience or the understanding or the knowledge to easily train. And because it was such an important way of providing good care for an animal, and it helped the humans that were working with these animals care for them better, um, I started really teaching people how to train and, and really began working with so many different species including the human species, so. I think you you and I have maybe, I don't know if you agree, but I think training the human species is definitely the hardest of them all, isn't it? It's the hardest, but it's also the most important, you know? Um, Abs you know I, I, I absolutely agree with that because you're not going to see results for the rest of anything if you don't end up training the human species. Right. Um, that That's actually really exciting. Also, whoever's um, joined us here, there are quite a few people um, that have come in that are saying, you know, hello, Madali and Ken, Gaurav says, somebody else says, Chris Kirti says hello, Pooja says hello. Um, quite a few people joining us here. Kashi's here as well, saying hi. Um, uh, also, I haven't mentioned, but uh, Ken is also a biologist. And the, I think I was so fascinated when I I read about you working with marine animals and i'm guessing that um training played a, a i wouldn't say a much more important role but a pretty important role uh, when you worked with those animals because you know like my dog i can't take her out i can't take her out for a walk and get her have her mental and physical stimulation there but i'm just thinking that training would play such an important role in their lives because that's probably one of the only ways you can provide mental and physical stimulation to them, right? It is. It's it's not the only way, but it's probably one of the most critical things. It's it's whether you're working with your dog at home or whether you're working with an animal in a zoo, um, these animals need constant stimulation. They they their brains are always active and and 
Training provides them a job to do, provides them an activity to do. It provides them a way to get physical exercise. It provides them with lots of outlets for many, many different things. And it also has helped us to teach them things to learn more about their needs, about how they live in the wild. All of that is a big part of how training contributes to the study of those animals and most importantly, to their everyday care. Got you. So training actually helps us give them a better life, right? It's, Absolutely. It's a great way to do that. From my perspective, I always think about professional training. And what I think about when I think about providing the best optimal animal care for any species of animal, I always suggest there are four cornerstones that form the foundation of good animal care. And that includes a veterinary program. All of our animals need to be healthy and you need to have a relationship with a veterinarian. Um, the second one is nutrition. Our animals need to eat a balanced diet, need to have the nutrition in their bodies so that they are healthy. Um, the third one is a an environment that is healthy for them. And so they need the right temperature. They need the right space. They need the right social structure. And the fourth cornerstone of professional animal care is a good training program, something that allows the animals uh, to learn, to live in their environment, helps us provide better medical care. So for me, training is an essential component to any animal's life. Absolutely. Um, I, I've only worked with dogs until now, but I, I already see your point because, you know, training my dog, they trim its nails calmly. That means, you know, she, she won't have like long nails hurting her or, or even ear cleaning sessions or any of that. Um, that that makes a lot of sense. And I love the four uh, basic cornerstones theory for sure. Um, can I, I also want to know how did you come about at, you know, starting working at Karen Pryor, um, you know, and just your journey there? Well, uh for those who don't know Karen Pryor, Karen Pryor is has been a pioneer in the world of positive reinforcement training. And she has, I met her many, many, many years ago and became a colleague of hers, uh, taught with her on uh, at major conferences. And about five years ago, um, she turned 80 years old and she was considering uh, retiring, but she had built a very big organization, uh, an organization that teaches trainers, an organization that holds conferences, an organization that does many, many important things for the positive reinforcement training world. And um, she approached me right after her 80th birthday and she said, Ken, I'm looking for someone who can take over the running of my organization, someone who can help lead the uh, the positive reinforcement community into the next generation, into the next decade, into the next uh, many years ahead. And I was very humbled by her offer for me to come into the organization. And so that is what I did. I, at the time, I was working very prominently in the zoological field, but I had also been consulting as a consultant for the last uh, 20 years working with dogs, working with law enforcement, working with guide dog organizations, search and rescue organizations, and uh, the opportunity to step into her role and help form a direction for positive reinforcement learning and for spreading positive reinforcement education uh, really appealed to me. And so that is how I came on board here at Karen Pryor Clicker Training and the Karen Pryor Academy. Wow. Okay. That's, that's amazing. That brings me to my, I, I, know, I definitely, I think I've been opened up to the world of clicker work over this past year more than ever. I've been in, in the field for nine years now, but I don't think I've ever found myself using a clicker more than I have in this past year. Um, but for our viewers, I, since you are the best person that can answer this question, I want to ask you, what is a clicker? Um, and why do you use it? And what are the fundamentals of clicker training? Sure. Well, first of all, a clicker is just a toy noisemaker. I have one in my hand right here. All it is is something that makes a clicking sound. And there's no magic in the clicker. This is just a piece of plastic and metal. There's no magic connection that you get when you use a clicker. But what a clicker does is if you can teach an animal that the click means good, that the click means 
food will follow or that the click means a toy will follow. What ends up happening is the click becomes the signal that tells the animal, well done, good job. It's a way of saying, thank you. What you just did was perfect. What that allows you to do when you're training is, you know, so often we, we find ourselves saying, gosh, I wish I could just dog and explain what I want. The clicker kind of gives you a mechanism for doing that. You don't have to use a clicker. What it really is based on is what's called marker-based training. It's a very scientific approach to training. And what you discover when you study animals in the wild is that Animals are always looking for some sign that what they're doing is good or what they're doing is bad. And they look for those signs. They look for those, those, those sounds, those movements, those things that tell them that they're doing the right thing. So even if you don't use a clicker, your dog is going to be looking to you for some sign that they're doing the right thing. And they will figure it out based on the way you move, the things that you do. So all that we've done by creating Clicker as part of the training world is it helps the animals learn a very specific sound. And it, it doesn't have to be a Clicker. It can be uh, a word like yes. It can be any number of things. But what it does is if you use a marker consistently. It helps you communicate precisely when the animal's done something correctly. It helps you fine tune your training. In fact, what we find is, at least in my experience, it makes training go faster because there's no confusion as to whether the animal's done something right or not. That click marks the moment that they did the right thing and that they're going to get some kind of reinforcement. So for me, I don't always use a clicker when I train, but I would say I probably use it 75% of the time because it really helps with precision. It helps me make sure the animal understands what it is I'm trying to teach. And I find that by using the clicker, I can teach many, many behaviors much more quickly. It helps facilitate the learning. So that's why I use the clicker and why it's, it's all based in the science of learning. Animals will learn without a clicker. You just find that when you teach them the meaning of the clicker, it can speed up your training. It can make the training go so much faster and it provides clarity for the learner as to what it is you're trying to teach. Absolutely. I think in, in my personal opinion, um, you know, before I started using the clicker, I used to use the yes marker. Um, and I personally also found that number one, my yes, like when I did say the word, um, you know, it, it's not as I would say like it doesn't pinpoint that microsecond or that you know that moment as precisely as the clicker does. Um, plus, I just found that so many people, including myself, just use yes uses yes like <laughs> way pretty often rather than you know the click sound. Right. One of the challenges that people have with verbal markers is they work, and sometimes if your hands are full and you have no nothing to click with, then that's where a verbal marker can become very helpful. But the challenge that we find is that when we use a word like yes, we all, we tend to vary how we say it. Sometimes it's yes, other times it's yes. And so what happens is it, it its precision gets lost. It still works. But when you have a mechanical marker, it's, it sounds the same every single time. It's just as loud. It's just as soft. And there is no emotion attached to the clicker. And so it helps really clearly define what it is you want. Saying a word like yes or good is fine, but you will get better precision out of a mechanical clicker. Yes. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Um, absolutely. That that makes um, absolute sense. Though, I have a question. Um, so you know how you spoke about the dog looks at you um, for something, for a sign that it's doing something right. Um, how does that work into, because, you know, of course, the way I do it is like click means reward, click means food, click means this, and that's right. how I pair it. Um, how would you say, how important do I, because when I work with a clicker with a new dog, um, I'm just teaching him like click means food, right? So right. at that point in time, his relationship with me might not be as 
deep or he might not really be looking at me for it being, you know, if I'm letting him know it's the right thing, but it's almost like he's just looking for the reinforcement anyway. And and at the beginning, that's absolutely true. The the animal is looking for the reinforcer, but that's going to be true no matter what you do. Uh, animals are built to look for reinforcers or to escape yeah. from something that makes them scared. And so that's just all animals learn that way. And so with time, though, as you use a clicker, as you train it, and even if you don't use a clicker, what happens over time is the animal learns that you are the provider of good things. You're the one that provides them with food. You're the one that provides them with toys. You're the one that plays with them. You're the one that provides them with comfort. And so what happens is as you use your positive reinforcers, they help you build a stronger relationship with your dog. All relationships, if you think about relationships in your life, people that you love, people that you care about, the thing that builds those relationships is the reinforcers that come from being around those people. Um, you are reinforced by the person who gives you love. You're reinforced by the person who gives you attention. You're reinforced by the person who makes you laugh. You're reinforced by many things. And that's what helps make a friendship. And that's what helps make a relationship. And the same thing is true with our dogs. By providing variety and reinforcers, the animal begins to look at you as more than just a provider of food, more than just the person who can throw the ball, but you are a person that they can depend on who provides safety for them. And so training is all about relationship building. Um, and just because an animal is looking to you for food doesn't mean you don't have a good relationship. That's a very valuable way to help build the relationship sure. with time. What happens in a, in a real relationship is it becomes more than just about food. It becomes about so much more. Got you. So just to put things into perspective, when, I, when you do use a clicker, initially, of course, you're doing a click and then a food reward, a click and then a toy reward. Um, but eventually you can, are you saying I can move to a click and just pet? You can, but it's it's risky. What I tend to do, it, it takes a lot of experience to get to a point where you recognize what an animal truly finds reinforcing. And Absolutely. with yeah. many animals that really enjoy petting, enjoy a belly rub, enjoy a back rub, that, that can be a valuable reinforcer. However, um, most of us, provide petting to our animals, even when we're not asking for behavior. And so consequently, the animals learn that petting and belly rubs and things like that come all the time. And so consequently, generally, when you're using a clicker, it's your way of really pinpointing something particular. And so I tend to pair my clicker with food all the time. I don't even pair it with toys most of the time, but as I build a relationship and as I get to know an animal more, I often find that for many of my dogs, oftentimes the opportunity to chase a tennis ball can be a stronger reinforcer mm -hmm. than food. And so you can begin to incorporate other things, but it's just critical that you wait until you really understand the relationship well. So I usually start clicker training with food. And then as I get to know the dog better, I can expand the kinds of reinforcers that I use when I'm training. Got you. Um, so basically that's also something that I tell my clients is, you know, you have to look at the dog that's in front of you and see what that dog is motivated to work for and what that dog wants um, at that point of time. Because, you know, I, of course, we've all had dogs that, you know, will give up I don't know, a bone for a ball versus uh, we'll give up both of those for just a good boy or a good pet. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's important for everybody to remember that reinforcers change based on where the animal is. For example, I have a dog, I have a Labrador retriever that when I am working inside my house, he will work really well for just a small piece of kibble. Nothing really very valuable at all, but he loves his kibble. But if I go out into the country and go out into a forest where there are deer and rabbits and other animals running around, 
then suddenly my kibble is not very reinforcing. Suddenly the environment has changed and his interest in everything in the environment is so high that I need a higher value reinforcer. When I go out into the forest where there's all, then maybe I need cheese or maybe I need some other item that will be of higher value. And so nothing is reinforcing under every condition. And so we just have to learn to know our animals well enough to recognize that in this condition, a small really reinforcing, but under these conditions, only food is really reinforcing. So as you get to know your animal better, you begin recognizing what that animal finds most valuable and what's most useful to you under different situations. What is the most, what is the highest reinforcer you have used with uh, any animal? Or specifically, let's talk about dogs. Um, say in a situation like that where he's extremely distracted, what is your usual, you know, squirrels, deers? Yes. Well, well, what what I have found when working with I work with a lot of animals that are working dogs that are working in real world situations where you cannot control the environment, where a deer could run out of the forest at any time, or a squirrel or a rabbit could show up and. And, and be very tempting for, for the dog. And so there's a couple of things that are important. One, finding high value reinforcers. And so I often will reserve um, for many of my dogs, usually a, 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 a piece of high value meat or cheese or something that they really like that I don't use during normal training and having that available first. Secondly, it's really helpful if you want to have control of your, over your dogs when there are lots of distractions. You first train a lot of helpful behaviors in a low distraction environment. So you start by teaching an animal a recall, which is a just a signal that tells them to come back to you quickly. You teach them a sit and a down, and you teach all of those things in low distraction environments. Then once they really know those behaviors well, then you're not worried about teaching them the behavior. Now you're teaching them to do the behavior with minimal distractions. So then I might move outdoors, but I might move outdoors to an environment where I can control the distractions, where I have a friend who maybe will throw a tennis ball or who uh, can do some movement or things that cause my dog to get distracted and look around. But nothing too distracting so that they realize even with distractions, I do this behavior and now I get a higher value reinforcer. And I gradually move to those more distracting locations. And then usually when I first move into those high distracting locations, well, then I might have my dog on a leash or a lead of some kind so that if they're distracted, they can't go too far because I have them on a lead. And what will happen is then I'm going to use my recall signal or use that cue. They can't chase after the other animals, so they respond to the cue. I reinforce them really well. And then often what I do is then I let them off the lead to go run and chase whatever they want to chase so that they learn that I will let them chase those distractions, but it's good if they wait until I tell them that it's okay. And that way, they learn that I'm willing to give them the things that they want, but I just have them wait until the timing is right for it so that I end up using the distraction as a reinforcer because that's what they really want. And so by having that control on the situation, I can make <coughs> them realize, oh, I will allow them to do that. And then they're more willing to pay attention to me because I'm going to let them go chase that rabbit later when it's appropriate not always but once in a while got you okay got you. and what about dogs that are not food motivated at all like i have i'm sure we've all worked with dogs that are both of us have worked with dogs that are extremely nervous uh just will not care about food whatsoever when they're under any kind of stress yeah. It's a really good question, and 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 it's a fun question because we get it all the time. And I used I have to quote Karen Pryor because whenever someone says to her, "My dog's not food motivated," her answer is always, "Well, he is alive, isn't he?" And if the answer is yes, 
only a dead dog is not food motivated. The challenge is, like you suggested, is that they're nervous. And so often when we go to a shelter, for example, and get a dog out of a rescue center, everything around them is scary and everything around them is new. So eating is a low of low interest. Yeah. But everything is of low interest. What they're looking for is safety. And so it's interesting because I'm writing an article right now uh, that I'll be publishing next month called Eating is a Behavior. And I always like to remind people that when you're working with scared, shy, nervous animals, the first task we have as a trainer is to help them feel more comfortable. And as they feel more comfortable, then they will be more comfortable eating. And so for me, the, the focus of training is to make an animal feel safe, to make an animal feel comfortable. And I've often found that when I'm working with an animal that's nervous, if I can get them to a place of comfort, a place of trust, then suddenly their interest in eating returns. Because that's the problem, is that they're just too nervous. And usually when a dog is nervous and scared, Tennis balls are not going to be motivating. It, there might not be anything that's super motivating. So the most important thing is trying to find their comfort level and help make the training environment a safe environment. And of course, you will find dogs that are more motivated to play with a tennis ball than they are to eat food. And that's fine. Um, I will use the tennis ball. I will use whatever motivates them, but I still need to get them to a place of comfort and a place of safety because once they feel safe and comfortable, then they are much more willing to do many things for you. So I always look at eating though as a behavior and realize if they're not willing to take food, it probably means that they're, they're hyper vigilant. They're very nervous about what's going on around them. So I need to find a way to bring them to a place of calm and comfort because then I can usually start using food. Okay. That means I, I definitely understand that and will definitely take that into consideration when I'm working with my next nervous dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your work with, um, of course, other species, because that's something that's uh, extremely interesting and I was very curious about. Um, I heard you, as in I read, that you work with butterflies. Yeah, and it's you're currently working with elephants. I am. I'm currently working with a project in Africa, uh, helping teach wild elephants uh, to change their migration route to avoid poachers. Um, animals like elephants don't necessarily recognize borders, and while many, many African nations have very good laws against poaching, there are some that don't. And sadly, when an elephant crosses the border into another country, sometimes they walk right into danger. And so we have been working for many years on a project that is helping to teach a, a large herd of almost 400 elephants to change their migration path to avoid going through a country that has very poor poacher protection. And so we are using uh, man-made watering holes as reinforcers to guide them on a new route. And then once they learn that new route, we'll begin reducing the number of watering holes that we use, uh, but hopefully still maintaining their new migration route. Uh, this has been a very successful project for us so far. We've been able to uh, successfully reroute these elephants uh, for several years in a row now. And we have now seen um, poaching reduced uh, to nothing in this particular group. And now we're seeing a population of elephants that for 20 years has declined in numbers, begin to increase in numbers because of no poaching and because of natural breeding. And so that is a very exciting project that I'm working on right now uh, with COVID-19 and the, 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 the pandemic going on around the country, it's challenged us a little bit in, 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 in taking care of this because of uh, my travel restrictions are such that I have to go to the country where this project is taking place and quarantine for a couple of weeks before we move on with the project. But it's worth it and it's an important project because it's helping this population of elephants. So that's the elephant project. You, 
you mentioned the Butterfly Project. That was a few years back. I was contacted um, back in 2015 by a uh, the director of a, uh, a botanical garden. And they were setting up a very large garden display in a uh, football stadium in London. And part of their display, they wanted to, to, to display butterflies and talk about the symbiotic nature between plants and animals. And she had this idea that maybe butterflies could be trained uh, to fly across the football stadium on a specific queue. And uh, she asked a bunch of people that she knew uh, if that was possible. And most of them said, well, I don't know, training butterflies and that before. But maybe you should contact this trainer in the United States, Ken Ramirez, because he claims you can train anything. And so maybe he'll do it. And so she called me and, and asked, I thought that training butterflies was possible. And I said, absolutely, because I've always believed that any animal can be trained if you know what motivates it. And so I said, yeah, I, I, I think it would be possible to train butterflies. I don't know anything about butterflies, but if you found someone with the knowledge and skill to do it, I certainly think it would be possible. And I remember she asked me, then she, she immediately said, well, would you like to join the project? Would you like to come to London and help train our butterflies? And I said, sure, I would. And, and then I remember I hung up the phone and I thought, oh, no, I don't Why know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they eat. I didn't know much about them. Um, I knew that they fly pretty. They have a lot of colors, but I didn't know anything about them. But um, it started me on the journey of so much of the training that I do. I have learned over the years that the way you teach an animal doesn't change. It's, it's not that different, whether it's a butterfly or an elephant, a dog or a cat. All animals learn the same way. What I needed to learn was the biology and the things that make a butterfly unique. Uh, you don't reinforce a butterfly the same way as you do an elephant. And so I kind of needed to work with some biologists, some butterfly experts who helped me learn about the food they eat, the sounds they hear, the things they see, so that we could then teach them. And we basically taught these butterflies to fly across a football stadium on cue. And we ended up training three groups of butterflies to fly at three separate times. And um, uh, it was actually a very, very simple training procedure. You know, when people hear that you train butterflies, they think, oh my goodness, that's amazing. But all we did was teach the butterflies to fly from point A to point B. And it's no different than teaching your dog to come from his bed to you. It's just a simple come behavior, but because it was butterflies, it seems very unique. And because we trained it on a cue, we had 10,000 butterflies flying across the air at the same time, which was really, really spectacular. So um, the BBC filmed it for a documentary that's coming out in the future. So it'll eventually be available for everybody to see. I am like my mind is definitely blown right now and I'm, i have so many questions but i'm just going to ask you one of them what was the reinforcer that you used um in that situation well for the butterflies we we used three different each group of butterflies we used a different reinforcer uh for some of them it was fruit uh, for others, we extracted nectar from flowers, and for the others, was a there is a little package of food that they make for people to use that have backyard gardens that want to attract butterflies to their area, and it's a it's a a, a mixture that you mix with water that makes a kind of a sugary solution that butterflies really really like. So we used all three of those reinforcers to attract the butterflies to these big bowls that we had that we uh, used to, to deliver the reinforcers. That is amazing. That's, that, that's definitely, yes, absolutely mind blown. Um, it, it was, awesome. it was, it was fascinating to work on the project, you know, I, because when I was asked to help and I said, yes, after I hung up, I was worried because I thought, oh, no, I don't know. I've never trained a butterfly. In theory, you should be able to do it. But when we ended up doing the project, we simply 
paired the cue. We we used a uh, uh, a, a high pitched tone that the butterflies could hear, and we would play the tone and then give them these big bowls of food. Play the tone and give them these big bowls of food. After just two repetitions, the third time we played the tone, thousands of butterflies started flapping their wings and flying. And it was, I got chills watching all these butterflies come up off the tree branches. And I thought, this was on the third training session. I said, ooh, this is going to work. And so then we began moving the bowls slowly, one meter, two meters, three meters, four meters, until eventually we moved them all the way across the stadium. And it took us 19 days. In 19 days, we had them flying on cue all the way across the stadium. Wow. And I, I, I was just, I can't believe you said it was an easy process because I cannot imagine that being an easy process. No, well, it, it was easy, when it's all said and done, it was very easy to, 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 to figure out what we did. We didn't know if it was going to work when we first started, but once it was done, it was like teaching any other animal to come to a specific location. We just had to figure out the right cue and figure out the right reinforcer. That is, that is amazing. Um, that's awesome. And just fabulous. So I guess anytime now, I, lesson learned is like anytime anyone asks me to train any animal, I'm just gonna say yes. Then I'm gonna call you oh, and it, you figure it out. I mean, my my experience has been that any animal is trainable. The the challenge does become it's like when you said some animals aren't food motivated. The reality is you just have to find what motivates them. Every animal is motivated by something. Um, maybe not the food you're offering today, but maybe you need to find a different food. You need to find a way to make them comfortable and you need to find the right reinforcer. And you just, that's where every animal is different and finding the unique reinforcers that will work for a particular animal is something that can, can take some time as you get to know the animal better. True. Um, again, I wanted to discuss, um, I know you, you have a book, it's called I Have the Trainer. Um, what is it about? Because it is available in India. Um, you know, just tell, tell me a little bit about it. Uh, sure. This is uh, my most recent book. And really what has happened over the years since I have been with Karen Pryor Clicker Training is every month I, I write an article uh, about some aspect of training. I've written about my butterfly training. I've written about the elephant training. I've written, but I also write a lot about fundamentals of training, what it is that makes a good trainer, uh, the importance of various aspects of training. And so over the years, I've written articles, reasonably short articles, you know, uh, several pages long, but, but, but little tidbits about training. And after I'd written these articles for many, many, many years, um, someone approached me and said, you know, there are if you could put all your articles together, you would have a really interesting book that would guide people through the training process. And uh, and so we had the idea to collect all of these different articles that I'd written, put them into one volume. And so this book, The Eye of the Trainer, are really various stories about animal training, transformation, and trust, as the subtitle says. And so in it, I, I tell a variety of stories of working with a reindeer, working with a dolphin, working with a tiger. Uh, but I also tell stories about how to start training. What are the important ingredients to begin training? What is it you train first? Or I've, as a teacher who has traveled all over to lecture about training, advanced trainers will often ask me about tools that they've heard about that they don't read about in the science, like the keep going signal or the end of session signal or jackpots. And so because there's such myths surrounding some of these concepts, um, they're all people are always asking me, does this work? And what is this tool? And should I use it? So I would start writing articles about that. So the book, The Eye of the Trainer, is a collection of all of these different articles. And I've divided the book into six different chapters. Some of it is foundations and how to begin training. Others are advanced tools, should you use them. Another chapter is on um, training of different species. And I have two chapters that are focused on the training of people and, and, and the challenges that we have teaching people to become trainers. And 
different aspects of how you can do that best. And so that's that's what the book is really about. It's really a collection of various articles that I've written over the years in my career that I thought people would find interesting. And and I've been very fortunate. The book has been very popular here in the United States and we now it's now available in a number of other countries as well. Yeah, it's available in India on Amazon. Um, so guys, if any of you want to go grab the book and read about all of Ken's fascinating journey working with multiple species, um, go grab the book. Um, I wanted to ask you Ken about, um, you know, what do you think are, I wouldn't say disadvantages, but since we're discussing clicker work and I think it's, um, I wouldn't say a fairly new concept, but I, um, haven't seen too many people use it as yet. Um, in India, it's definitely gaining popularity, but what are the pros, cons? Like, is there anything that you would specifically like to talk to pet parents about who are here watching you today or even trainers about, about the clicker? Sure. Um, I think the advantages of the clicker to me are very clear. The, the clicker helps speed up training. It helps provide clarity to training. So if you care about precision, if you care about speed of training, if you care about communicating clearly, the clicker is a really, really great tool. The disadvantages to the clicker, well, the most obvious is it's an extra tool that you have to have in your hand. And so for some people, that is um, is is a downside. And that's the main downside is the fact that, that you have to have something in your hands. Um, we now have this new device. It's called a clicker ring. What I like about the clicker ring is that it's something that you can you can place on your finger, and so it can be available to click. But I still can use my hands, and so that helps solve that problem. The other issue with the clicker is can be is if you have a deaf animal, if you have an animal that doesn't hear very well, well, certainly the clicker doesn't work. But you can still use the same concept. Uh, uh, for all of my animals, I actually use a variety of markers. Um, uh, a point is a visual marker. I touch the animal. It's a tactile marker. And a click is a audible marker. And that allows me to use that marker in a variety of different ways. Um, and, and the other challenge, of course, for some people is, is it takes a little bit of coordination to click at just the right time. But when I start teaching people to use the clicker, we just play clicker training games. We we practice with the clicker. And after a while, it becomes such a valuable tool that I, I never go anywhere without it. Even when I'm not training, I have a clicker in my pocket because I because I'm a trainer, people will often say, hey, can you help me with this training? And I have it available to me and it makes it, makes it possible to, to really facilitate training. But I, again, I just remind people that the clicker is not a magic tool. It's just a toy noisemaker. And all that it is, is about is pairing the toy noisemaker with a, a reinforcer that is valuable to the animal. And once they realize that connection, it just makes training so much easier. So I don't really find that there's super big disadvantages to it other than it can be cumbersome if you don't have one with you. But that's why I often train a verbal marker as well because it works in the absence of, of the clicker. Got it. Do you also use the clicker for um, you know <clears throat> the continuation marker or do you just use it as like a terminal marker? Do you I use, use that it for you personally? Yeah, I use it only as the the terminal marker, the thing that says, correct, you're done, you get reinforcement now. I know people that use it for a continuation marker, and that's fine. What's most important is that however you use it, that you use it consistently the right, the same way with your animal. Every animal can learn it has a different meaning. Uh, but for me, I tend to use it just as a, you did it right. I'm going to give you a reinforcer now. And so for me, it's sort of the, the ending marker for finishing most behaviors. Got it. Also, what if I have multiple dogs in the same room? How um, particular are you when you're working with the clicker um, when in, I'm teaching my dog that, you know, click means you're going to get a reward every single time. And that's my promise. Um, but I have another dog in the same room. Like, well, how do you deal with that sort of situation? 
that's a great question. And I do a lot of work with multi-animal households where, where people who have more than one dog and they're, 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 they're not sure how to go about doing it. If I'm training and I'm training all the animals at the same time, then I use the clicker to mean if I click, I'm going to reinforce all of you. But if I'm only training one dog, one of the things that happens with time is the dogs will learn the context of the clicker. I have been in uh, training schools where 10 dogs are being trained simultaneously by 10 different trainers and there's clicks going off all over the place. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is, do the dogs get confused? Sure, sometimes. But what you find is after about a minute, the dogs go, oh, your click is the one I'm supposed to listen to. And they learn to tune everything out. It's very much like if you're in a room with five different people and I turn to you, Mitali, and I talk to you in a quiet voice and I say, hey, can I ask you a question? Everybody in the room might still be able to hear me, but they recognize that I'm asking you the question. And how do they know that? Well, it has to do with the way my body language is and the context. Animals will learn that the click is not for them. But when I'm working with my dogs, I have several dogs. I tend, if they're all in the room at the same time, when I click, I reinforce them all. Um, or I separate them into other rooms so that the click isn't as confusing. Um, you just have to be very thoughtful when you're using multiple animals, how you use your tools. Yeah, I'm actually in the process of building my own board and train facility right now. So I'm trying to get like as soundproof, um, you know, walls between the boarding area and the training specifically so that um, I don't have the other dogs getting confused with the clicker. But at the same time, I agree with you where, and I've worked with, um, you know, 30 dogs in the same room and I've had my dog figure out very quickly that, oh, it's her clicker that reinforces right. me and not anybody else. They're, they're so intelligent. They're, they're, well. they're very, very smart animals. Yes, and they're very perceptive of what's going on in the environment. If you are consistent in how you use a tool like the clicker, the animal will learn what it means surprisingly fast. Yes. Um, again, we have a few questions um, that I actually you know, would like to bring up. Um, so Kashi is asking you, um, if I'm constantly engaging the dog throughout his life in learning new behaviors with the use of the clicker, how do I ensure that my dog does not respond to a clicker sound made by other persons? I think we've just kind of covered um, that, but I know one needs to wean away from the clicker use, but I find it useful in teaching a new behavior. So that means I am constantly using a clicker throughout his life. So the question again is, can I train my dog to discriminate and ignore click sounds made by other persons and stay focused on me? I think, yes. Kashi, we kind of covered it, but Ken, if there's anything else you want to add to it, please go ahead. Yeah, we, we did just cover that, but it, it's amazing how, yeah, every once in a while, someone else will use a clicker and my dog will get very interested in it and excited by it. Um, but over time, your animal begins to learn that the click that matters is the click that mm -hmm. comes from my my mom, my dad, my person, and they will quickly learn to not pay attention to other clickers. Is it a little confusing at first? Yes, especially if the dog is a brand new learner. But once your dog gains experience, your dog will begin to realize, okay, I just focus on my person clicking and it doesn't matter what other people do. Got it. Um, Amit has a question that says, can a dog, can a trained dog be be taught new behaviors with the help of a clicker because for him it shall be an absolutely a new tool yes absolutely um i have found that when i first start training that i don't even worry about teaching the clicker um you can literally begin by doing something with the dog mm -hmm. doesn't matter what and as he does whatever he's doing because you've shown it to him or done you click and you reinforce him it doesn't take very long for a dog to go, oh, well, I get food every time I hear that click. It can happen in two or three sessions. It would be, it, it would be as if um, I clicked and I gave you lots of money. I gave you, I don't, I don't know what, how much money is a lot of money for you, but if I clicked and I gave you some money and I clicked and I gave you some money, after three times, when you hear the click, your hand's going to go out and say, you're going to give me some money, aren't you? It becomes very, very clear what it means. And so uh, you'd be surprised how quickly the dog goes, oh, I like the sound of that click. And so even in the very first session that you're using it, usually after three or four uses, 
that dog already knows I like that click. And it, it's amazing how fast they learn it. Um, absolutely. I'm just going to add to that. I'm at, my dog is nine years old. I started clicker training with her this year when she's nine. Um, and it's amazing how quickly she's picked it up. Um, and again, I used it the exact same way Ken did. She already is a trained dog. She knows behaviors. And I just started integrating it in the behaviors that she knows already. And she's already like, ah, that sound means good. Something's good coming my way. And she's actually picked it up very, very quickly. Um, yep. Um, Kashi has a question. Can a dog be desensitized to a click of sound made by others? Remain tuned to the click of sound made by B. I think it's, you know, another, uh, we've covered that um okay priya asks can multi multi animal household hinder human animal training responses like we are a multi cat household and that seems to have an effect on how our cats don't work well with training concepts well first of all there's two different questions there one is about uh um you know can a multi animal working with multiple animals. And the second question is really about cats. Um, for whatever reason, cats have this bad reputation. People often feel like they're not trainable. And the difference is, I think it's because we look at cats and often want them to behave like our dogs. But cats are not dogs. They are a different animal. And the, the thing that motivates them is unique and sometimes very, very different. But they are very, very easily trainable. I have trained many, many, many cats. Um, and so first, understanding what it is that motivates cats. Cats are food motivated. Cats are toy motivated. Cats are motivated by lots of things. So you have to learn what your individual cat likes and doesn't like. So that's the first step, is really understanding what it is that is necessary to, to keep cats engaged and keep them interested in the training game. The second question is a more complicated one, and that is, how do you adapt your training when working with more than one animal? You know, when you live in a multi-animal household, um, these animals can learn to be competitive for each other. They, with each other, they, they want your attention. And so one of the biggest rules I have when training multiple animals and they're working in the same room or in the same household is the idea of fairness. I'm not saying that a dog or a cat understands fairness the way we do, but if a dog or a cat sees you giving food or toys to one animal and they're not getting it, they become competitive. They can become jealous. They can become frustrated. And so for me, if I can't separate the animals into separate rooms when I'm training, then I think about every training session as being with the entire group. And if I am going to reinforce one animal, I try to reinforce the other animals as well so that they stay engaged and participate in the process. So I think this question is, is fascinating because it becomes a question of A, do you understand what motivates your cats as an individual? And then once you understand that, how do you work with them in a multi-cat household? And one of the things that I like to do is I like creating stations or spaces for the animals to go to when they're training. So if I have multiple animals, I put a, a mat on the floor and have each of the animals go to a specific mat, or I have them go to a platform, or I have them go to a place so that they kind of learn like, oh, this is where I come to learn. And now that I'm here, I, I pay attention here, I get reinforced here, and that way you can engage all of the animals at the same time, but you have a sequence or an order, a place for them to be to keep them engaged while you're working with them. It's a, I teach an entire course on working with multi, multi-animal households, and it's very hard to answer all of the different techniques necessary in a very short uh, uh, live broadcast like this. But there are a lot of tools that can help you train multiple animals. But those are some tips that I would suggest. Yes. Um, thanks, Priya. I hope that answered your question. Um, and I think that gave me some clarity as well, because generally how, you know, of course, with cats, I have a title, but with dogs, I've definitely either done one in the crate, one outside while training, and then the other one goes in the crate or goes on place. Um, you know, it sounds like the cat where I have one cat on a mat and then the other one is that, am I on the right track here? 
<laughs> yes, I mean, I, for me, it doesn't have to be a mat. It can be a platform. It can be whatever you find useful. It's just that when I'm starting to work with more than one animal, I just like giving them some place to be. And sometimes instead of a mat, I might have my dog, one dog sit on the, on the, on the sofa and then the other dog sit on the floor, but I give them a place to be so that they learn while I'm learning, I have a place to be. And when they're sitting in that place, that gives them something to do while you're working with the other animals. So it keeps them occupied because you've given them a task to do. A job. Yeah. A job. Yes. That, that makes Okay. Um, uh, Mona Lisa says, I have found adapting to the clicker to be challenging. Uh, before I reviewed some of Mithali's work, it is good reinforcement. Uh, I'm glad, Mona Lisa, you have been watching my work with the clicker and um, adapt into it. <laughs> well, I definitely uh, think it helps when you watch someone else use a clicker. When someone knows how to use a clicker and you get to see it and use it, it, it starts to make more sense. So that's really good that you're able to show people and let people have some way to see those click that clicker being used. Yeah, I, I agree. I think for me as well, when I saw someone else use it, it you know, just like, oh, oh yeah, I get it now. And it, it it's always interesting. Um, Mira is asking, Mira is a fabulous trainer, colleague, and a very dear friend. Uh, she's asking, what important don'ts would you suggest while using a clicker? I, I think the most important thing is don't use a clicker unless you can back it up with a food reinforcer, at least at the start. I think it's really, really important. You can train lots of things without a clicker, but if you're going to use a clicker, make sure that you always click and follow it with a treat. That way the click has very, very specific meaning. That would be my most important don't. Got it. Also, what about the timing? Like I have actually personally... Um, had clients, which again, I love all my clients and they're, they're all try their best. Uh, but you know, who just can't manage to get the timing absolutely right. And I find sometimes that the dog is getting confused. Um, so there have been times when I'm like, Hey, you know what, just use the yes marker. Um, but I guess, you know, the timing is also, um, is something that I, I, yeah, the, I would say. Timing is an important aspect to all training, whether you use a clicker or not, if you're not able to reinforce properly in a timely way, you end up reinforcing the wrong behavior. And so that's always an aspect to it. And that's gonna be true of any kind of training. Um, the, the more closely you can follow the good behavior with a reinforcer, the more meaningful, the more, the, the more quickly the animal will learn. So timing is very important. True. Uh, Kirti asks, can I click multiple times for different behaviors and reward together as per the number of clicks? I guess I saw a few videos. I'm not able to track them back, but yeah. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I personally do not approve of that process. I think it confuses the animal. Can an animal learn if you click multiple times and then feed at the end? Uh, they can, but at what ends up happening is 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 it can confuse them. And I, I think it takes a really, really experienced trainer to be able to accomplish that. So generally speaking, if you're going to use a clicker, I suggest you feed immediately after the click every time. It just makes it cleaner and more precise for the animal. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. Um... Shalaka, is everyone from the family expected to carry a clicker for life? <laughs> no, absolutely not. First of all, usually it, what I find in most families is it's usually one member of the family who really ends up being interested in the training. And it's really the training of new behaviors where the clicker is most helpful. Um, I don't think it, it would be a bad thing if they all carried one, but nobody's going to remember to carry a clicker with them. And not everybody's thinking about training all the time. You can go your entire life and never have a clicker. The clicker is just a great tool if you want to increase precision. It's a great tool if you want to increase your communication. So yes, it's great if they all have a clicker, but realistically, you'll find that you don't use it all the time and you don't need it all the time. When when a dog sits, for example, if you if you want to reinforce your dog for sitting and the moment they sit, you're able to toss them a treat, you don't need a clicker. You can just immediately reinforce that behavior. The clicker is just a great tool 
for training new behaviors. It's a great tool for increasing your precision. It's a great tool when you really want to communicate something specific to the animal. Then I do think a clicker is really, really valuable. But to be a clicker trainer doesn't mean you always carry a clicker, doesn't mean you always use a clicker. It's just a tool. Like any other tool, you think about the tools you use in your kitchen to cook, you think about the tools you use outdoors to fix your car. Just because you have a tool doesn't mean you use it for every situation. It's just a helpful tool for the right situation. So you don't have to have everybody carry a clicker all the time unless they're training new things. But even if they are, a clicker is just a helpful tool that will facilitate a lot of aspects of training, but it isn't something you have to have. Yeah, I personally would be very happy if I get a family that's like, we're gonna carry clickers all the time. That would be uh, a dream to train, to train and work with the dog. Uh, personally, I personally find clicker, um, I use clickers more when, like you said, new trick training. Um, or mainly tricks or chain behaviors. Um, you know, when I'm tra training something complicated yeah. is when. Um, I think we're on to our last question. Um, according to you, is there an ideal time of the day when the effectiveness of training is better than the rest of the day? You know, my answer to that is it's very dependent on the individual learner. Um, you'll find that just like with people, some dogs are morning dogs and some dogs are evening dogs and some dogs are, are, are a bit well, well rested at certain times of the day. So this is where I think you pay attention to your dog and ask yourself, when is my dog most interested, most focused, most uh, active? And that's usually the good time to train. Um, and so it's it's not about time of day that's universal for all dogs. It's really about that individual's comfort level, what they're used to, and when they're most motivated themselves. And so I don't think there's a time of day that's better than others. Uh, I certainly work with dogs all around the clock, and especially in the work that I've done with search and rescue dogs. A search and rescue dog has to be ready to go out and search at any time of the day, depending on when someone is lost and they can learn to work at any time of the day. So I don't really think it's affected by time of day as much as it is affected by the individual dog. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, Ken, thank you so much um, for this entire session. I think we've answered um, all of the questions uh, and covered a lot of important information. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, uh, you guys can all follow Ken uh, on his Instagram. His Instagram handle is right here on the screen. Um, I also have been uh, watching a lot of Ken's videos and, and seminars that are available on YouTube. And I think I've learned a lot over just the past few days. Um, so do go check those out as well. Um, I'm Mithali Salvi. I'm just gonna put in, you guys can follow me on Instagram as well. Um, I do share a lot of dog training tips and all my clients that I work with and a lot of my naughty bratty cat, uh, but who I've been wanting to click a train, but I've been lazy. It's completely on me. Um, um, yep. I think we are, oh, there's one, one last question that just came in. Ken, is that, okay. is that okay? Sure. Um, what is the one most important thing that you have learned or taken away from years and years of working with animals? I think that's a great way to end the session. I, I think the thing that I've come away with over the years is realizing that when you're teaching and when you're training, the learner, the animal is always right. Whatever they're showing you, if the animal doesn't want to do something, it just simply means that they're nervous or scared. It means pay attention to what your animals are telling you. Sadly, our animals cannot talk to us in a language that we understand. But if we learn to read their body language, if we learn to recognize what they're telling us, that is the most important thing that we can take away from our relationship with animals is that they, they have, they're very expressive and they express it through their body language. And so when an animal shows you that they're nervous, that means that there's something wrong with that situation. And so don't push, don't force, listen to them and they will become a better training partner. They will become a better student because the animal is always right. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having this conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. 
Um, thank you, Dog Spot, for having us both on here. Um, this was absolutely fabulous. Thank you, everyone that tuned in. Um, see you guys soon. Bye. Bye, Bye Ken. Thank you.